Good evening. You're watching the main news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Edna Tse. And I'm Raymond Yang. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Occupation protests smaller across Hong Kong as student leaders wait for formal talks with government. Secondary school students back in class and civil servants return to work despite road closures. Powerful typhoon hits Japan, leaving one U.S. serviceman dead and two missing. Protesters are rallying at their bases in Admiralty, Mong Kok and Causeway Bay tonight. But there are fewer people at the key road junctions they've been occupying for more than a week now in the name of democracy. Student leaders say the ball is in the government's court to discuss a solution to the crisis. But there's no guarantee anyone can persuade the protesters to leave the streets. In the meantime, students have gone back to school and civil servants to the headquarters on the first working day of the week. Hong Kong woke up to a working day this morning and at first glance it looked like most protesters had abandoned their main positions in Admiralty, Tamer, Mong Kok and Causeway Bay. But the blockade of key roads in the name of democracy continued and the protest zones began filling up again as the day progressed. In Mong Kok it was relatively peaceful throughout the day after Friday night's violence when protesters clashed with angry mobs of local residents and shopkeepers fed up of the noise and disruption, and suspected gangsters attacked young demonstrators. There were occasional disturbances, such as this, when a man who was apparently drunk tried to cut his wrists with a broken bottle. He was quickly subdued by officers in riot gear. In another indication of the danger posed by criminal elements out in the streets, police found bags full of knives on a footbridge a couple of hundred meters away from the Admiralty protest site. Secondary schools reopened on Hong Kong Island and thousands of civil servants went back to work at government headquarters. But protesters continued the siege of the compound and the chief executive's office. Leung Chen Ying and his ministers stayed away from the headquarters working from government house and alternative offices instead. Leung's cabinet will hold its weekly meeting tomorrow morning at government house instead of the headquarters. The Hong Kong Federation of Students said it had initiated preliminary talks with officials ahead of the planned meeting with Chief Secretary Carrie Lam. Student leaders said the ball was now in the government's court to take it further with sincerity and discuss a solution to the crisis. Well, we are still observing whether it is a tactic used by the government uh, to postpone or they are really willing to have dialogue with uh, the students. And it will show us by the date of the next meeting when it will be held. If uh, the meeting is keep being pended, then you could see or you could say the government has no integrity or sincerity to have meeting with students and citizens. But the Federation is just one of several groups heading the mass rallies, and there's no guarantee any of the civil disobedience leaders can persuade protesters to leave the streets. And uh, rather the Federation of Students can represent me, and I don't think so, because I think everyone has independent thinking. Democratic Party Chairwoman Emily Lau has warned that the protests could escalate if the talks failed. Lao said it was up to the SAR and Beijing governments to negotiate a settlement. Nejko President Zhang yuk sing had a look at the situation at Tamer for himself today, ahead of the council's meeting on Wednesday as lawmakers return from the summer break. I hope that all parties will um, act with restraint. On the one hand, we certainly hope that the government will not take um, uh, drastic measures to evacuate uh, um, uh, this place uh, by force. Uh, uh, on the other hand, we hope that um, protesters will uh, consider the needs of um, all uh, people uh, working in the government uh, uh, buildings and uh, uh, leave enough room for maneuver. While business operators have been complaining of losses caused by the closures, there was some positive news from international ratings agencies Moody's and Fitch. They said there should not be any major impact in the short term on Hong Kong's economy, 
and credit ratings as the key pillars were not directly affected. Some 3,000 civil servants went back to work today, and 30,000 secondary students back to school after more than a week of closures and public holidays. They had to put up with roadblocks and traffic diversions that are expected to continue in the coming days. ATV's Anne Cheng reports. Government employees began arriving for work at around 7.40 a.m., most of them using the footbridge connecting Admiralty Center to Tamar after protesters cleared a path for them. About 20 demonstrators stood around passively as civil servants passed through a two-meter gap that was opened up for them on the barricaded footbridge. Financial Services and Treasury Permanent Secretary Elizabeth De and Food and Health Undersecretary Sophia Chan were among the familiar faces heading into government headquarters. After they were stopped by protest blockades last Friday, many were happy to get back to work, despite the traffic detours and extra commute time. This woman who works as a cleaner in the government compound was pleased about being let in today, having left home 30 minutes earlier to get to work on time. Access routes from Siddick Tower and United Center remain barricaded. The government complained that protesters were still blocking the junction of Longwa Road and Timwa Avenue, which meant there was no vehicle access. After the week-long break, because of the mass protests, 30,000 secondary school students were back in their classrooms this morning as more than 30 schools reopened in Wan Chai, Central and Western districts. Special bus routes were arranged to help students get to school on time, but many still had to leave home earlier. With the reopening of Longwa Road outside the chief executive's office, traffic was mostly smooth, with some occasional congestion. This taxi driver said it now took him 20 minutes to get through, instead of the usual three minutes. He complained he was losing a few hundred dollars a day. And even though he felt protesters were justified in fighting for democracy, he could no longer support them because they were depriving him of his daily wages. Another taxi driver coming from Tung Chung said he did not mind the inconvenience because he supported democracy. There was more congestion at the intersection of Petter Street and Connaught Road Central outside Exchange Square. All across the city, people went back to work today, putting up with delays due to roadblocks and traffic diversions with no end in sight. Anne Cheng, ATV News. Primary schools in central and western districts will resume classes tomorrow, but kindergartens will remain closed. And police are calling for public sympathy for frontline officers under intense pressure as they try to keep the streets peaceful. Principal Assistant Education Secretary Sophia Wong has some good news for parents of primary school children in Wan Chai, central and western districts. While kindergartens will remain closed, Around 25,000 students from the area's 52 primary schools will resume classes tomorrow after a largely successful trial run for secondary schools today. Assistant Transport Commissioner Albert Su says secondary students did not have too much trouble going back to school this morning as they left home before the rush hour. Certainly the cooperation of the private car owner of not trying to Hong Kong uh, during this period of time would certainly help uh, relieve our congestion problem. Administration Director Kitty Choi rejected rumors that police would forcibly remove protesters, barricading the entrances of government headquarters in Tamar. I think through dialogue is the best means uh, at the moment that we have successfully uh, arranged with the uh, demonstrators to allow a widened access to enable civil servants can gain access to work. I hope they can really consider uh, retreating from Longwall Road as well as uh, Timwa Road to enable vehicular access uh, for government vehicles as well as supplies vehicles to gain access. The police force insisted has deployed enough manpower to maintain law and order, again rejecting accusations that officers turned a blind eye to the violence in Mong Kok last Friday. There are organizations alleging that uh, police have not handled the confrontation properly. I must emphasize that this is extremely unfair to our officers on the front line. 
The public can see from the television that our officers have been maintaining law and order diligently and faithfully at the scenes in Mong Kok. Police have received more than 270 complaints about officers neglecting their duty or abusing their power. They are appealing for public understanding of the difficulties they face, as frontline officers have been working long hours under huge mental and physical pressure. Thousands of protesters and their supporters were out in the streets last night, but they managed to keep it peaceful. Student leaders took the opportunity to hold informal talks with government officials ahead of their planned meeting with the chief secretary. Protesters were out in force last night, showing no sign of leaving the streets they have occupied for more than a week now. Protesters, many of them students, continue to ignore repeated warnings by community leaders that there might be serious trouble as the government wanted the roads clear for people to return to work this morning. But despite the dire predictions, there was no police crackdown and it was peaceful at the protest zones. Adding to the sense of optimism, the Hong Kong Federation of Students said it was willing to return to the negotiating table if the government met its conditions. First, there should be um, several rounds of dialogue between HKFS and the government. Second, the dialogue between the HKFS and the government should be on equal footing. Third, the government should confirm and execute the outcomes of the dialogue. Student leader Lester Shum revealed last night that he had held talks with officials, including Constitutional and Mainland Affairs and the Secretary Lau Kong Hua. Um, we should emphasize here that the dialogue tonight was not a formal dialogue of political reform. It was only a preliminary meeting. There were familiar faces among the crowd in Admiralty, as they asked the public for their understanding. I understand that you know um, the commercial interest of many people in the locality have been adversely affected. That I understand, and we are sympathetic with that. But again, the police can always use their uh, uh, legal power to clear the site. And I think all the people there are quite prepared to be arrested. I don't think we will have any results soon. So we will have to, pre you know, we will have to persist. There will be disappointment. There will be broken promises. Each time there's a disappointment and broken promises, people will agitate to come back here. Although a fierce government critic, media tycoon Jimmy Lai dismissed speculation that police were colluding with gangsters to stir up trouble and discredit the protest movement. I, I don't believe the police is connected with the mafia. You know, the trial. You know, this is too. <coughs> Too unbelievable, you know. I, I, I'm sure those those triads were organized or still organized by some uh, other interests. In stark contrast to the rowdy scenes and mob violence over the weekend, there was relative calm in Mong Kok as a heavy police presence kept things in check for most of the night. Scores of anti-triad officers were stationed at the junction of Argyle Street and Nathan Road, where the main protest base is set up. Hecklers showed up every now and then, including this man who chanted Long Live Mao Zedong. But the protesters refused to be drawn into arguments and responded by singing him a birthday song. Officers were quick to break up the rival groups to ease tensions. To other news, a powerful typhoon headed out to sea today after lash lashing central Japan with heavy rain and leaving at least one person dead. The storm forced the cancellation of flights and train services and two U.S. servicemen are still missing after being swept away by high waves. ATV's Joyce Wu reports. Typhoon Panfon made landfall near the city of Hamamatsu in central Japan this morning, lashing the region with strong winds and heavy rain. Hundreds of flights were cancelled and more than 400,000 people advised to vacate the area due to fears of flooding as rivers threatened to burst their banks. Services on the Shinkansen bullet train west of Tokyo were suspended, affecting millions of commuters and travellers. Three U.S. servicemen were swept away by high waves on the southwestern island of Okinawa yesterday. One was later found dead and the other two are still missing. A university student who was surfing in the seas of Kanagawa Prefecture, south of Tokyo, is also missing. 
rough seas are complicating rescue efforts as winds of up to 180 kilometers per hour have forced search teams to suspend operations. Some parts of eastern Japan are expected to be hit with 8 centimeters of rain an hour and a total of 20 centimeters before the storm sweeps out to sea. Japan experiences an average of 11 typhoons a year, according to its weather agency. Joyce Wu, ATV News. Some world headlines. An American who caught Ebola while in Africa has taken a turn for the worse, according to U.S. officials. And Bangkok residents are praying for the swift recovery of Thailand's king after surgery to remove his gallbladder. ATV's Ben Rook reports. Thai King Pumipon Adunyade, the world's longest reigning monarch, has undergone surgery to remove his gallbladder, according to the palace. The update came after Prime Minister Prayut Janocha, who seized power after a coup in May, visited the Bangkok hospital where the king is recovering. The king was discharged from hospital last month after nearly five weeks of treatment for stomach inflammation. He was readmitted to hospital late on Friday due to a fever and irregular blood pressure. The revered king is seen as a unifying figure and his health is a matter of much public concern. Well-wishers gathered outside his hospital today to pray for a speedy recovery. The first person to be infected by Ebola in the US does not appear to be doing very well according to doctors at a hospital in Dallas, Texas. We've seen a lot of understandable concern. Because of the deadly nature of Ebola, and we're uh, really hoping for the recovery of the patient in Dallas, we understand that his situation has taken a turn for the worse. We know that Ebola is a very serious disease, uh, and we're hoping for his recovery. Thomas Duncan became ill after arriving home from Liberia two weeks ago. Since March, Ebola has killed more than 3,400 people in West Africa. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control has identified 10 people who had direct contact with Duncan as being at risk of infection, but insisted it's prepared to stop any outbreak. Brazil's President Dilma Rousseff placed first in yesterday's election, but did not get enough votes to avoid a runoff and will face pro-business rival ISU Neves. Rousseff led with 41% support, compared with 33% for Neves. After it was clear she would face Neves in a runoff at the end of the month, Rousseff said she would continue to fight for changes Brazilian people had voted for. Third-placed Marina Silva is expected to throw her weight behind Neves. Ben O'Rourke, ATV News. Time for sports with Bo Lang. And there's no stop.